What's up my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy and welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business and sometimes just do commentary about feminism and the LGBT community as well. Today's video is going to fall into that latter category because there's a topic that I really want to discuss on this channel which is kind of outside of my normal books and business type of content. If you guys have seen any of my book reviews pertaining to books that have LGBT angles or things like that, you probably know that one of my favorite topics to discuss on this channel is bisexual erasure because I think it is a massive problem not just in literature in the media but in life in general and it turns out that it being a huge problem is not just my opinion because I found actual credible sources to back this up so we're gonna talk all about that girl cite your sources girl back that statement up the reason I particularly wanted to talk about this topic today is that this past week a larger youtuber named Lindsay Ellis put out a video that very briefly address this topic just a little bit and I wanted to talk about the way that she addressed the topic in her video along with the way that she has spoken about this topic in the past and talk about why I really disagree with a lot of what she says but also agree with pieces and overall talk about what we can take away about that into the future as we perceive how the LGBT community exists in the world. I ran a poll on my Instagram to see if people were interested in this topic and the overwhelming majority of people said that they were, so let's do it. Get you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should take up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. Hey everyone, and welcome back to my channel, or welcome for the first time. If you're new, please don't forget to subscribe because every Monday and Friday at 11 a.m. Central, I put out new videos about books and business, and sometimes commentary about feminism and the LGBT community. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to my second channel, which is linked in the description below. That channel is called Your Morning Guru, and on that channel, my friend RK and I live each week in the life of various business gurus doing their morning routines, reading their books, sometimes trying their diets and things like that and it is a lot of fun and we see what we can learn from that so please subscribe to that channel and don't forget to tune in with us every weekday morning at 8 a.m central now let's talk a little bit about the video that lindsay ellis put out this past week and what that has to say about bisexual erasure and bisexual visibility within the media and within the lgbt community at large and what implications we can take away from that now before i get too much into my thoughts and my opinions on this i want to give a quick disclaimer, which is that I actually have been a fan of Lindsay Ellis for a really long time. I think her critiques on media and her movie reviews and her videos kind of delving into the media and delving into YouTube and how YouTube affects media and her overall video essays are really well done. Her videos are really well researched. She cites her source as well and I think that she just does a great job contributing to the overall media criticism and movie review genre on YouTube, which is actually one of my favorite genres to watch outside of the business guru takedowns and anti-MLM stuff. So I've been a fan of hers for a long time and I want to make it clear that I do still like her. I still like her and I think that she's a really great creator and I'm still going to continue following her. The context overall, her video was in response to a lot of criticism she had recently been receiving on Twitter and I just want to make it very clear, the concept of cancel culture in general is never something I have been in favor of. I'm actually writing a novel called Cancel Sean Boston, which is kind of a parody of internet drama and cancel culture and that kind of thing. So I've never been in favor of the idea of saying, you know, someone has officially done too much. They are officially wrong. They can never come back from this. I don't think that that's a healthy way to incentivize people to continue to try to improve and to continue to try to have, you know, open discussions about things. Even people that I have regularly criticized on my channel, including Grant Cardone, Rachel Hollis, those type of people. I've even said if they apologized for the ways that they'd scammed people in the past and showed that they were actually committed to doing better in the future, I would potentially change my mind and become a fan of them if the right circumstances appeared. I just have never been a fan of the idea of your past will always define you. I don't think that's healthy. That's just my personal opinion on that topic and I'm not going to get too deep into that because that's not really what today's video is about, but I also think that it's very healthy to be willing to criticize people that you're a fan of and also to sometimes listen to people you disagree with. So let's talk about it. So right here, this is the section of the video that we're going to be focusing on today. I'm going to quickly on one and a half speed play the section of the video that we're going to be talking about and then from there I will break it down. So before we do any commentating, let's listen to what she had to say in full. 2015 Bisexual Erasure. 
So again, another post clipped out of context, and it is quite literally the only time I have ever written about my sexuality, and stuff like this is the reason why I was like, wow, never talking about that again. It is from my now deleted blog, but I linked the archive page below. And in effect, it was basically me kind of working out my feelings on feeling like bisexual erasure was almost a form of privilege. And I still kind of think that's true. And the thing about sexuality is it's just like such a personal thing. And that's why this like conflation of like the political and the personal, while necessary, often makes me really uncomfortable because it was like such a painful process for me and one I never really figured out how to reconcile. So I just never did. So I've never really had a coming out or embracing my truth, more just like slow, quiet, begrudging acceptance. Like I just have these laundry list of experiences like from being in college and going to gay clubs and having lesbians suddenly turn cold when they find out you're bisexual to the popular axiom at the time of buy now, gay later, or highway to homo, or gay until May to Dan Savage way up into the 2010s saying that bisexual men don't exist and it's all a phase or all the way to former respected person Glenn Greenwald saying that the bisexuals are transing the lesbians out of existence as recently as last month. So I can't help but feel a sort of imposter syndrome every time I do anything even tangentially pride related. I feel tolerated but not accepted. And why do I want to go to that parade? Like, oh. You're here, fine. I guess we're contractually obligated to let you in. So I think for a lot of bisexuals, especially women, we do kind of live in this liminal space of both privilege and erasure. It is painful to feel ostracized from the community when accepting your identity has caused you so much pain in the first place, but at the same time, you can opt out. You can, in effect, pass as straight. Like, if I had a dollar for every time someone called me a straight white woman in the last few weeks, well, that, that would take care of my Patreon for at least a month. And to answer very good faith actors like Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald, Glenn, what was his mother thinking? So to answer very good faith actors like blurp, 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 as to why proportionally bisexual people tend to end up in heterosexual relationships 75-25 rather than than the 50-50 logically should be. Hmm, I wonder why that could be. You know, just besides the fact that as a proportion of humanity, there are more straight people to choose from. Well, here I am making a thing out of it. Am I in the club now? Okay, and that's the end of what she says about this. And then from there, she goes into a thing about some kind of interaction that she had with Mara Wilson. And I'm not going to go into that section because I think it's weird to speculate on people's personal lives like that. Like that's, that's her and another person's personal interaction. I'm not going to analyze that. That seems, that's, that I don't feel like that's my place. So the entire reason that she was addressing this in the first place in this video was because of this blog post that she had written back in 2015. So we're also gonna read this blog post and take a look at it. Now, normally, because you guys know I'm a fan of people being able to say, you know what, I thought this stupid thing in the past and now I don't think this stupid thing now and I changed my mind about it. Normally I'd be like, okay, a post that went up almost six years ago, what's the point of kind of getting mad about that or anything? However, in the video she explicitly said that she does still agree with what she said in this post. So this post is basically she's saying it's fine. She's now deleted it, however, linked to the archive version of it. So it's totally fine that I'm looking at this right now and everything. And I just wanna be clear that the reason I'm talking about this is since she did post this and says that she does still agree with this, she also made the point that like sexuality is a very personal thing and that she might personally feel that there is a privilege or an opting out element to this kind of thing. And that that's fine if she wants to feel that way. I'm never going to tell another person that the way they feel about something very personal to them is wrong. I think that's stupid. However, the reason I am going to delve into this is that she did put this blog post out publicly and she did address it in the video and said that she still stands by what she wrote there and because this video now has over a million views and I personally think that some of the stuff said in here is incorrect and contributes to a harmful culture that I think it's important that I address this and give my viewpoint on this as well in a video that's going to get far fewer views than her video got but I still want to address it because it is an idea that she is spreading far and wide so I'm going to counter that. This is the blog post she wrote a while ago called Bisexual Privilege, Bisexual Erasure. And I'm not going to read the entire thing because a lot of it's, you know, some quirky storytelling and cute things like that. And I think she's a good writer. Makes sense. That's why she had a book that hit the New York Times bestselling list, even though I think the New York Times bestseller list is a scam. But that's going to be a different video that everyone keeps being like, Savvy, when's the New York Times bestseller list video coming? And I'm like, it's coming soon, guys. But like all of these things keep happening that are timely topics that I want to talk about now so that I can suck on that sweet, sweet algorithm juice. Anyway, let's talk about this post. What she starts off by framing this in this post, I largely agree with and think that what she's saying here is very accurate. She says, in the media and indeed in our culture as a whole, there tends to be an undercurrent of skepticism where bisexuality is concerned as though it is somehow less real than being gay or straight. The agnosticism of sexual orientation, so to speak, bisexuality tends to get erased when someone picks a side. Alan Cumming married a man, so he is gay now. And Hesh, I don't know how to say her name, is with a man, so she is straight now, etc. So she's not saying that that's what she believes, but that's how culture as the whole views it, and that's how bisexual erasure tends to happen, and I completely agree with her on that. What she's saying here as a, a representation of what people as a whole tend to think, I think is absolutely true. Then she goes into, I cannot speak for all bisexual women, but I've always felt divorced from the struggle as it pertains to bisexual people. I've always bristled a bit when people call me straight or on occasion saying that Shea Apocalypse is run by straight cis women. 
Um, when, while yes, we are cis women, none of us are straight, Nella and I are bisexual, Elisa is asexual, I suppose a part of my detachment from feeling of struggle is my personal suspicion that true Kinsey zeros or com completely and utterly straight people are in fact much rarer than we'd like to admit. I'm not the weird one, you are Mr. Straighty McLying to self. I think that's kind of funny, but at the same time, that's kind of doing the same thing that, like, you're accusing, like, you're you're trying to erase straight people. Straight people are real. They're, they're real. I know a lot of us want to be like, straight people, what, what even are they? I've never met a straight person. Unfortunately, they're real. That was a joke, too. Me I have many straight friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of get what she's saying here, but she also brings up an important point, which I don't think is brought up and fleshed out in detail, but is kind of, kind of a background type of point, which is that there's a lot of asexual erasure that happens too. And I, a lot of my really close friends and people really close to me in my life are asexual and have kind of had a hard time either realizing that and accepting that about themselves just because there's not a lot of cultural awareness of it. So I think that's a hugely important point to talk about as well. However, talking about it as in like, yeah, people just assume we're straight and it's cool. It's like, no, that's not cool. That's not cool at all, but let's continue. And let's, we'll talk about this more. So she says here, the big reason I've never seen fit to turn my sexuality into a thing as it pertains to public discourse is because I didn't think it was anybody's business but my own. That is perfectly fair. Nobody should ever feel pressured to come out or to talk about parts of themselves that they're not comfortable talking about yet just for the sake of, you know, contributing to visibility. That's not any single person's burden to bear, and every person should talk about only the elements of themselves that they feel are important to talk about or the elements that they feel comfortable personally talking about publicly. I will never say that. We even saw in the book community recently there was a huge controversy over the fact that there's the author Becky Albertalli who wrote the uh, the book Love, Simon and Leah on the Offbeat and has become popular for being an LGBT author. However, a lot of people had assumed that she was straight, so they were like, how is this fair that a straight author is getting all the credit for writing all these LGBT books? They're not even own voices. Well, Becky Albertalli actually is bisexual but had not come out about it because she wasn't comfortable coming out about it yet and felt forced by the court of public opinion to make that public about herself because otherwise she was receiving so much criticism and felt that people were kind of applying that as to how valuable her books were and things like that. So I think that that should be kind of a warning example of why we shouldn't pressure people to reveal things about themselves and we shouldn't assume things about people like that. So I completely think it's totally fair what she's saying here. It's nobody's business but my own. So she talks here, you know, the idea of bisexual erasure has never particularly burdened me. Um, and, you know, that's fine. That's her talking about her personal experiences, and if she's never felt that burden, that's fine. What I think there is here, though, is kind of a lack of understanding that the way it's burdened other people has been really difficult, and we will talk about some of what those ways are in just a moment. This is where I start to really disagree with what she's talking about, and then we'll go back into the video and see what she adds to it here in the video itself. She talks about how bisexuals don't always know their place in the LGBT movement, and says here, because we are in some ways the most privileged group we can opt out and many of us do. So I have a lot of problems with this and it would be one thing if this was a thing she wrote six years ago and then changed her mind on but the fact that she's standing by this statement of this is the most privileged group because we can opt out is utterly ridiculous to me. She clarifies that by saying it's the sexual orientation version of passing which is... No. I've always had a huge problem with the phrase straight passing privilege because people often attribute straight passing privilege to particularly the bisexual community and the asexual community, which are the two communities as part of the overall queer umbrella that tend to get erased the most. And people say, well, it's because you have straight passing privilege. What does that even mean? You know who else has straight passing privilege? People who are exclusively homosexual but haven't come out yet. I've even heard people call that closeted privilege. Closeted privilege does not exist. And I, I will die on this hill. This is a hill I will die on. Closeted privilege does not exist. It is not a privilege to be forced socially to hide the truth of yourself and hide the truth of the way that would be best for you to live your life. That is not a privilege. It is not a privilege for you to have to suppress elements of yourself or suppress potential relationships or block out 
about potential healthy relationships you could have in your life because of social stigmas and because of discrimination. That is not privilege. That is discrimination. That is a prejudice and a discrimination by definition. So to call it passing or to talk about straight passing privilege, I find not just offensive, but also just false, just incorrect. I think it's weird that people will be like, oh, you can, you can have straight passing privilege. That's the same thing as talking about like, if you have a trans person who is living in an unsafe environment and is not able to start their transition yet, and to call them having cis passing privilege because they haven't been able to safely start their transition in that environment, that's inaccurate. That is not accurate. That is a horrible thing to say. And I find the same type of thing tends to apply here where it's like to force someone to stay closeted is not a privilege. That is discrimination in action. I don't understand. Anyway, let's continue. When she's talking about this idea of opting out here, I think what she's saying is that if you are bisexual, you could potentially have relationships with the other gender, which there isn't just one other gender. But I think what she's saying here is, you know, I'm a woman, I can have relationships with men, which I am married to a man. So people could say you have straight passing privilege, which I don't because I don't think a single person has ever thought I was straight when looking at me. But then this sentence right here almost negates the idea of straight passing privilege because she says, I don't think the reason most bisexual women tend to date men is because that's always been their preference. That certainly was never the case for me, but because it's easier, the cultural machine is already designed this way, why rock the boat? What you're describing here is discrimination. What you're describing here is the opposite of privilege, of people feeling like they can't pursue the relationships they want to the most because of a cultural stigma against it. That's not privilege. This also seems to be leaving out the idea that there are a lot of bisexual people out there that are in same gender relationships. One of my best friends is a bisexual woman who just recently got married to another woman. So she in no way has straight passing privilege. In what way could she have opted out of this? She couldn't because you could say, well, she could have married a man. Yeah, but the person that was the right person for her that she fell in love with and had the healthiest relationship with and the long-term relationship that she wanted was with another woman. And to say that like, oh, you could have had the privilege, you could have chosen to be with a man. Th that's basically the, the bullshit that we tell people with like, oh, just choose to be with someone that it's easier. That doesn't make any sense. That's to throw away a healthy relationship for that. What, how does that make any sense? Also, this is the thing she addressed in the video, but you know, we talk about like, Yes, there are lots of cases where bisexual people end up in relationships with the same gender, but there are also a lot of cases where they end up in a relationship with someone of a different gender. I'll use myself as an example. I am with a man. I would say that overall, I'm more frequently attracted to women than I am attracted to men. However, I ended up with a man and that was statistically the most likely thing to happen. We are gonna talk about why this happens because I think a lot of people get very confused and they're like, why do bisexual people end up more often in relationships with a different gender than with the same gender? It's simple math, guys. I'm gonna do some math. We're doing some math together. For easy math, this is not an exact statistic. I am rounding to make easy math. Let's say, that 90% of people in the world are straight and 10% of people in the world are part of the LGBT community in some way. That is not an exact statistic, but it's not far off. So let's say it's a 90-10 split. Let's say that I, as savvy, let's say, let's even just call it 50-50. Let's just say, let's just say uh, I like women and men equally. All right, now let's say I walk into a room with 100 people. Let's say I walk into a room with 50 men and 50 women, 100 total people. And let's say, just let's be Ben Shapiro and go, let's say for the sake of the argument, let's just say for the sake of the argument that I'm equally attracted to every person in that room, okay? I'm attracted to all these people. That's not that difficult of a situation to imagine because I'm attracted to a lot of people as you guys know. So I walk into this room, I'm attracted to all 100 of these people. 10% of the men in this room are part of the LGBT community and 10% of the women are. So there's 100 people, 50 men, 50 women. Five men are attracted to other men. Five women are attracted to other women. 45 men are exclusively attracted to women and 45 women are exclusively attracted to men. Well, would you look at that, all of a sudden, 45 of those women that I'm attracted to, I don't even have a chance with because they only like men. So I have no chance with any of them whatsoever. That just eliminated all of that. Now, let's say out of all of these men, okay, um, five of them are into other men. Let's say that, that, that three of them 
are bisexual and into men and women, and the other two are exclusively gay. So we will write them off as not an option for me. So I have an option in this room right now that I walked into with 50 men and 50 women of 48 men and five women to choose from. So statistically, is it more likely that I will meet someone that I connect with that is a man or a woman if, if I have 48 men and five women that are options out of this to begin with, which is statistically more likely that I will form a lasting relationship with? If you were just to roll the dice on this, if you were just to grab out of a, out of a bag with raffle tickets, what would be most likely? That's pretty obvious now that I broke that down. I feel like that's a pretty obvious thing, but people don't talk about it. Instead, they're just like, oh, bisexuals can just opt out of it. It's like, no, dude, this is, this is basic statistics. So anyway, I hope that made a lot of sense to you guys. We're gonna move on. But but most of all, I feel the lack of solidarity stems from a feeling that bisexual people reap the benefits from the LGBT movement while contributing the least. This isn't necessarily true, but that undercurrent still exists. Yes, the undercurrent exists, but it's incorrect. And like you said, it's not necessarily true. So wouldn't it make more sense to just like spend time trying to educate people about what is actually true? And it says here, of course, they are assumed to contribute the least because their struggle is less. Now, here's the thing about Lindsay's writing. When she talks in video, she sometimes will phrase something as like a hypothetical, but state it as a statement. I can't tell here if she's saying that she actually believes this or if she's trying to state this as a hypothetical thing that someone else might believe. That's why I get a little confused with this. But she does talk here about they can opt out of their non-heteronormativity should they so choose, but they can't. That's not true. You can't opt out of it. Even though I did marry a man, my attraction to women is something that is a massive part of my everyday life. This also assumes as a part of heteronormativity, everyone is involved in an exclusively lifelong monogamous relationship. The way that this is making so many assumptions about the hypothetical person you're talking about is ridiculous. Also, a lot of bisexual women I know who are in long-term relationships with men or who have even married men, there was no opting out involved in that. They still faced discrimination for their past relationships with women or for, for coming out to a family member that was unaccepting in the past and having to deal with a falling out from that, the same issues, the same pieces of discrimination are still there regardless of who you quote unquote end up with. Because who's to say what the end is? Who's to, is the relationship with the person you die with? Nobody can predict what the future is going to be. But even if you are currently in a long-term relationship of some, with someone of a different gender, that's not to say that in the past you didn't experience those things and are still experiencing the fallout from that. That's not to say that in the future you might not have a relationship with someone where you would suddenly have to choose between like oh wow am i going to risk being like this this is just this is just driving me wild so now that we've read a few items in this blog post that i think were the things that got people the most upset we're going to take a look again at what she said about it in the video break that down a little bit and then we're going to take a look at some sources all right let's go back to the video so again, another post clipped out of context, and it is quite literally the only time I have ever written about my sexuality, and stuff like this is the reason why I was like, wow, never talking about that again. It is from my now deleted blog, but I linked the archive page below. And in effect, it was basically me kind of working out my feelings on feeling like bisexual erasure was almost a form of privilege. And I still kind of think that's true. Okay, right here, she says, bisexual erasure is a form of privilege, still kind of think that's true. It's not true. I kind of explained why, but I'm about to delve into more of why in just a second. But basically, right here, we can say, she's saying outright, she still does think it's true that bisexual erasure is a form of privilege, which makes me want to vomit, but Lindsay, I'm still a fan of your work. And the thing about sexuality is it's just like such a personal thing. And that's why this like conflation of like the political and the personal, while necessary, often makes me really uncomfortable. This is a fair point right here, right? Like this is what I was talking about earlier, which is that like if she personally feels like she benefits from that and she personally feels like in her life she can benefit from being able to hide that, then that is fine because that is her personal belief on it. My problem in the blog post was the way that it was framed almost as if there's this social implication that that's how everybody feels. Because it was like such a painful process for me and one I never really figured out how to reconcile, so I just never did. So I've never really had a coming out or embracing my truth, more just like slow, quiet, begrudging acceptance. Like I just have these laundry list of experiences like for being in college and going to gay clubs and having lesbians suddenly turn cold when they find out you're bisexual. This is an important point here too. And this is why this is why this point feels almost a little confused to me. 
Because I think the stuff that she's delving into here is really, really important. The idea that even within the LGBT community, a lot of people who are bisexual end up feeling like they've been ostracized from it. I've definitely had experiences where, you know, I'll be on a dating app or where I've talked to women online and I'll talk to some uh, lesbians and they'll be like, oh, I don't date bisexuals, no bisexuals allowed. I want to live a life free entirely of men. I don't want to date a woman who has male exes in her past. And like, that's definitely not the majority of lesbians, but that experience does happen. So there are times where you feel ostr ostracization, ostracization. I don't know how to say that fast. I can't talk fast like Ben Shapiro all the time. But where you feel like you don't belong even within the community that's supposed to be working for your rights and is supposed to be working to benefit your, your group's interests, right? So you feel like you don't belong even there. And that becomes a problem because I, I don't see how that conflates at all with there being privilege involved because you feel almost like you will get, you can get discrimination from straight people who discriminate against the LGBT community in general, but then you also can get discrimination from people who are exclusively homosexual because they don't understand or don't believe it. So it's like, you, you, you see what I'm saying, guys? Anyway, let's continue. To the popular axiom at the time of buy now, gay later, or highway to homo, or gay until May, yeah, to I Dan agree. Savage, way up into the 2010s saying that bisexual men don't exist, or it's all a phase, or all the way to former respected person Glenn Greenwald saying that the bisexuals are transing the lesbians out of existence as recently as last month. So I can't help but feel a sort of imposter syndrome every time I do anything even tangentially pride related. I feel that that's this. OK, this is what I don't understand. So she's talking here basically about how the, the bisexuals also face discrimination within their own community. That is the opposite of privilege, but then she immediately switches to like, so I feel imposter syndrome when I do things pride related. I, I imagine she's probably talking about how repeated bisexual erasure over the years has contributed to putting her into that mindset about herself. But that form of like self-hatred or self-discrimination, I don't know, it's like internalized biphobia, I guess. She, I guess she's addressing that about herself. It doesn't mean that there's any, like having an internalized phobia of any of your identities does not mean there's a privilege, right? Like I used to have a lot of internalized misogyny. I talked about how like back when I was a quirky manic pixie dream girl, hashtag not like other girls as a teenager, I had a lot of internalized misogyny because I would be like, I'm not like other girls. I'm a hashtag quirky girl. And while I still do think I'm pretty quirky of a person, I don't disparage other women for being normies. <laughs> But my point is, like, just because I used to experience a lot of internalized misogyny does not mean that being female in a male-dominated world is a privilege. Does that make sense? So I think for a lot of bisexuals, especially women, we do kind of live in this liminal space of both privilege and erasure. No, the privilege part isn't part of it. It is painful to feel ostracized from the community when accepting your identity has caused you so much pain in the first place, but at the same time, you can opt out. You can, in effect, pass as straight. Like, no, you can't! <laughs> no, you can't. That's the thing that I don't get. It's like, first of all, if you're going to talk about the concept of straight passing being a thing, why are you talking about it exclusively in terms of bisexual women? Lesbians can pass as straight too if they're not in a relationship with another woman at the time. Gay men can pass as straight if they're not in a relationship with another man at the time. Are, do all single people have straight passing privilege by default like this just doesn't make sense to me i don't this this is this is just perpetuating a stereotype that people have used for the sake of discrimination in the past and that's why i'm not here for it so now we're going to take a look at this article that i found on mygwork.com which is a website about the lgbt community in the workplace and providing resources for that this article i found it's called how bi erasure is damaging the bisexual community because in that video she basically said that bi erasure can be a form of privilege because you can hide it i guess you can straight passing privilege it I don't like it, but this article is going to talk a little bit about why it's actually harmful that there is this erasure and it is actively harmful. It is not a privilege. It is causing active harm. It is a common myth. Focus on myth. It is a common myth that bisexuals are the least stigmatized of the LGBT community. That to be bisexual, you can simply date a straight person to camouflage into the heteronormative landscape and thereby escape a lot of the problems associated with being LGBT. According to GLAD, bisexuals have higher rates of anxiety, depression, and other mood disorders compared to gays, lesbians, and heterosexuals. The Office for National Statistics has found that bisexual women are twice as likely as their straight counterparts to experience domestic abuse from a partner, while bisexual men are disproportionately affected by 
HIV and STIs, according to a study from the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. Many have blamed biphobia and the stigma against bisexual men, as many bisexual men are too ashamed to seek out proper health care. Further studies have found that 37.3% of bisexual adults have reported experiencing depression compared to 17.2% of heterosexual adults. While according to the Pew Research Center, only 28% of bi or pan people ever feel safe enough to come out to their friends and family. Human rights campaign have found that bisexual people face a minority stress and are more likely to engage in self-harming behaviors and attempted suicide than gay, lesbian, or heterosexual adults. This correlates with a study in the Journal of Adolescent Health, which has found that bisexual and questioning females are at a higher risk of depression or suicide than any other sexual denomination. Many have argued that these problems are ex exasperated. I think, okay, I think they meant exacerbated. And guys, uh, don't go all grammar police on this article. I think they meant exacerbated. Because bisexuality is often ignored by the media, academics, and society at large. This is the crux of bi erasure, which is defined by GLAD as a pervasive problem in which the existence or legitimacy of bisexuality, either in general or in regard to an individual, is questioned or denied outright. Identifying as bisexual often feels like you're stuck in limbo, not gay enough for some and not straight enough for others, writes Kylie Rodriguez Cairo for Bustle. While bi people people make up 52% of the LGBT community, they are sometimes excluded from the narrative at pride festivals and LGBTQ celebrations because of biphobia and bi-erasure. Bi-erasure is a serious problem that isn't just promoted by straight people, but on occasion by the non-bi-queer community as well. See, that's what I've been saying all along, and I appreciate that this article is addressing actual studies that are showing how this contributes to real-life harm. Let's talk about the, the STD thing real quick. A lot of bisexual men are fed this narrative that they don't really exist or that this is a phase or whatever. And because bisexual men are often in a position where if they're engaging in sexual behavior with other men, they're at risk for the same STDs and the same rates of HIV exposure that a lot of gay men are, but they feel, you know, like they're in a difficult position where they don't want to address it medically. They're too ashamed to come out about this and that kind of thing. That's a huge problem. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about everything listed in here. I know that anecdotally, just from my own life, I can talk about about how like as a woman you feel that with other lesbians you feel that you are erased or sometimes discriminated against by women who find you now gross or tainted by being with men in some way and you also by straight men feel this discrimination of you are hypersexualized as like oh wow can I watch you make out with my girlfriend which if you're a big slut like me the answer is usually yes as long as your girlfriend's hot but that's still unacceptable to do to people overall right so you just feel like you're constantly in this position of like everybody's viewing you in either a hypersexualized or in terms of like a I'm disgusted by you kind of way. This is a website called health.com and this explores the ideas of how bisexual erasure contributes to overall health problems. Here we go. Despite the many stereotypes that surround bisexuality, it's re it's a real valid sexual orientation. According to a new Gallup poll, 3.1% 3 of US adults identify as bisexual. Younger adults are even more likely to identify this way with 5.1% of millennials and 11.5% percent of Gen Z adults reporting that they are bisexual. But even as the number of people in the U.S. who identify as bisexual increases, bisexuality continues to be played down, ignored, or essentially erased by mainstream culture. And erasing bisexuality have, can, can have potentially harmful consequences, including health complications. Bisexual erasure is a form of stigma, and stigma is bad for health, just to put it in a nutshell, Beach says. That goes for both mental and physical health. A 2017 study in public, published in the Journal of Sex Research showed that bisexual people have higher rates of anxiety and depression than straight, lesbian, or gay people. The research Researchers determined that bisexual invisibility and erasure is one of the key potential contributors to those mental health disparities. So while I agree that what with what Lindsay is saying in her video that that there is an overall feeling of this, what I disagree with is that the feeling of being able to opt out or having straight passing privilege, that that is a privilege at all. When in reality, a lot of studies have been showing that those things directly can correlate to mental health difficulties because you have people feeling like, oh my god, where's this place I don't belong? And she almost proved that point exactly in the video by showing that she felt uncomfortable about this or that she felt that she didn't really have a place she belonged and that she felt upset about that. So I don't really understand why she would then turn around and call that a privilege. That's the part that I kind of disagree with. So I just want to make it clear that a lot of the points she brought up I thought were good points that I agreed with, but the part where the, she then calls it a privilege or says that there is a opting out or straight passing ability, I completely disagree with that because as we can see here, this isn't a privilege. There are tangible real life effects and consequences. And here we go right here. One reason for this lack of access to the proper level or type of care might be because sexual orientation isn't a topic that a healthcare provider brings up. 
and it might be a topic that patients don't feel comfortable bringing up themselves. According to the Human Rights Campaign, research has shown that 39% of bisexual men and 33% of bisexual women don't disclose their sexual orientation to any healthcare provider. That's significantly more than the 13% of gay men and 10% of lesbians who don't disclose their sexual orientation to healthcare providers. This can lead to erasure and a lack of care. One of the biggest challenges is the assumption that doctors make, Feinstein says. He gives this example, a primary care provider discussing sexual behavior and screening for HIV and other STIs with a woman who's in a relationship with a man. In this situation, the doctor will often assume that the woman is straight and the screening or recommendation that follows is based on that assumption. But what if that woman is actually bisexual and has had or is having relationships with people of other genders? People might not get treated as they should if they're not recognized as a member of a certain group, he says. So there we go, right there, there's an example. So what did you guys think about this topic? Please let me know in the comments below. I really wanna hear everyone's thoughts on this as well, because while I agreed with a lot of points surrounding this particular topic that she said in this video, I also disagreed with the overall idea of calling it a privilege, and I felt that it was very dismissive of a lot of the actual negative consequences that we can see. So please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I am excited to read what you guys have to say. Please don't forget to subscribe to the second channel, and don't forget that this video is brought to you by my Patreon supporters and all my patreon supporters who contribute five dollars a month and up have their own websites or small businesses or social media linked in the description below so please check them out as well i will see you guys again on monday for the newest episode of your morning guru at 8 a.m central and then for next monday's new video on this channel as well so don't forget to subscribe to the second channel and on this channel don't forget to ring the little notification bell i will see you guys again then in the meantime don't forget to support small businesses and have a fantastic friday bye everyone Hit you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should pick up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it.